everybody, and welcome to another edition of AEW Spark. Well, I'm just a simple man, and my name is Noah Foster. And with me tonight, first time ever guest, he is also a follower of all the wrestling, a good hearted fellow. He participates in pro wrestling discussions, live chat, and other reviews. Please welcome for the first time ever to this forum, Mr. Uh, Tim Tobin. Tim, how are you this evening? Good, hanging in there. How are you, Noah? I'm doing very well, and I look forward to discussing all things All League Wrestling with you. And I'm sure this will be the first of May discussions going forward, because I welcome all. With that, ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and get right into this week's episode. As always, with AEW Spark, I'd like to first shed some light on AEW Dark. They've been really going all out, no pun intended, with these mega showcases lately, really bringing out the best in what we've seen so far with many of the independent towns that have been training out of the Nightmare Factory by QT Marshall, Dustin, Omega, and so much more. And they're also showing a bit of subtle storyline development within the AEW wrestlers themselves, not to mention really showing us what some of the AEW wrestlers bring that we don't normally see a lot of on Dynamite. So let's go ahead and take a look at what we saw tonight. Our first yeah, match was... A preview from 10 years ago from the um, Lunatic Fringe and his partner over there. Yeah, yeah, they, they even brought like back a yeah, so. they even brought back a grudge from ten years in our main event as the champion of AEW. John Moxley took on Robert Anthony in what I thought was a very impressive match, and I'll definitely let you talk more about that one because I always like to look up my guests, uh, give their opinions forefront more so than just hearing me. So, with that being said, let's go ahead and talk about Dark a little bit. And let's start with the first match. You know, SCU they've been on rocky soil ever since losing out both men the opportunity to try and go after the AEW World Championship. Scorpio Sky, Frank Kazarian. Well, here they garnered some momentum back and show why they are still a team and were your inaugural AEW Tag Team Champions. And they took on El Fuego and Lorada. I believe this was both these men's AEW debut. There was a couple of offensive moves in, but honestly, it looked like El Fuego, he was more so the victim here. When I think about the independent wrestlers and how they're showcased on here, it's one thing to get your name out. It's another thing to learn. Some endure, some impress, and some are just there to endure a rigorous test of either storytelling or brutality. Take a bump or give one. Because, again, SCU, uh, teams like Proud and Powerful, and towns like QT Marshall, they are just like these independent wrestlers. They started from where they are, and now they're here. So they're trying to, of course, bring these guys up towards the future. Uh, what was your thoughts on uh, SCU's performance tonight, Frank Kazarian and... Uh, uh, excuse me, uh, good, the name, uh, Scorpio Sky. Do you do you think now they could try and get some momentum back to go after the AEW yeah, tag they, rankings? I think they got way more momentum back after they lost uh, the match in Dark before. Yeah, so I think they bit them momentum. Like, it's time to get like momentum back into them. So I think in the future, they'll be, be better and better. I think so. As time goes okay. on. Yeah, because so. at, at first I thought they were teasing like a breakup angle, you know, because, you know, internal... Um, like rivalries, they do develop in teams. It does cause teams to separate, go on their own singles path. But SCU, yeah, they seem to be committed to each other. So I agree with you. And uh, El Fuego and Lowrider, uh, I don't really have a lot to say on them because, again, I don't know a lot of these independent towns. And, of course, I'm just coming off watching Dark because we're recording this 9 on 1 p.m. Tuesday night through 9 Eastern Standard Time. Uh, but I hope that we do get more of them because I believe it was their debuts. And I kind of want to see if El Fuego could do some more stuff with Frankie Kazarian, for example, because it looked like there could have been something going on there. But again, this was a really short match. This next match, though, it was not. And it really, really surprised me for two reasons. One, I think it was. SCU is ready. Oh, sorry. I think SCU no, is ready. I think SCU is ready for when the triple title comes out. Yeah, because I heard they're making a triple title for like two people. So I, I think SCU is ready for the title. That comes interesting. Out. So you think they might potentially be the first ever trios champions if that becomes a thing in AEW, considering they do hold trios records under AEW's win-loss rankings. Yeah. That's, I mean, I keep thinking that has to be something to come, but again, only time will tell us. So right now, they just have tag team, tag team. They got that new workhorse title in the TNT Championship. Then they got the AEW World Championship and the Women's Championship. And of course, all four of these titles will be defended at Fighter Fest. We'll get more into that shortly. But you do bring up an interesting point. Again, you might be sparking an idea for the future or a future discussion. Any time will tell. But give me your thoughts on this match because you've seen Lee Johnson and Allen Angels. They have been tremendous lately on AEW Dark. Neither man yet to get a win. However, I have been strongly supporting Lee Johnson, who constantly shows more character development, carrying himself in a match, telling a story. It really showed here as he took on the mysterious number five of Dark Order. 
And Got apparently it. number five is Alan Angels. And boy, you talk about metamorphosis of in-ring style from his fast, high-octane, high-flying, high-risk style to the likes of Ray Phoenix, you know, like Lucha, to a much more slower, methodical, ground-based style as Dark Order followers, Preston, and of course, Alex uh, Reynolds and uh, John Silver, they watched on. And it seemed like it was a really back and forth match. It was probably Johnson's strongest show, and he got some good offense in there. I think there was a couple of spots he failed to capitalize on, but again, he is learning. But the fact that uh, number five, Alan Angels, I'm just going to call him what he is now, number five, he kept attacking the man's arm, just kept focusing on the arm. But he didn't go for that towards the finish. He went with a suspended backbreaker into just a whiplash effect, face plant. But it wasn't brought on until Mr. Brody Lee came out. It was like Mr. Brody Lee was really getting impatient with his new recruit. Is he worthy of the Dark Order? Are you going to fail me? Can I make you extraordinary? Well, it looks like he did as number five. He did pick up the win. And then Dark Order, of course, they had their final statement as well about we are above you. We are one. I can make anyone better as they attacked Lee Johnson after the match. Lee Johnson, probably his best match to date. Alan Angels, well, I guess I know now he's Dark Order. But what a weird future ahead for him. Your thoughts on this match? Because uh, I saw Dark Order coming. Because remember, like, last week when Jungle Boy was there, and, like, he will want to recruit Cope again. I know someone was going to be with Dark Order eventually soon. Yeah, but I didn't know, like, Alan Andrew was going to be there. I thought, like, some other present, like, independent wrestler or new person yeah. coming in the ring would be with Dark Order. Yeah. So, that, that... I they're coming, like. Of all people, Alan Angels, who's been the most impressive, been in the ring with Ray Phoenix and Kenny Omega, took him to the limit, I might add. Now it's part of the Dark Order. Good grief. I did not see that coming. Talk about Major Swerve, but hey, maybe that means now he's signed on AEW while Lee Johnson isn't. So maybe that works in his favor. Maybe Mr. Brody Lee can teach him something. Maybe 5 and 10 can become a tag team with his arm heels. I, I don't know. What are your thoughts on Lee Johnson, though? The guy keeps losing. He's now zero and ten, but it seems like he has so much potential. I think you like if you fought against Pineapple Pete or some other independent, maybe he'll have a win eventually one day. Yeah. Yeah. I just wonder when he's going to get that win. Many people, shout out to my fellow followers uh, that follow Lee Wrestling, good hearted people on Twitter. They really believe in Lee Johnson, too. They believe he should get a win. A win might be coming for him soon. But again, Lee Johnson, like Taz says, you do great work, but you got to pick up the win. I thought tonight was his moment. Then again, it was still independent versus independent, but the whole Dark Order vibe and Mr. Broy Lee looking on, it kind of solidified to me that number five had to win this, or there was going to be hell to pay. Either way, Lee Johnson, great effort, man. Keep trying. And honestly, I hope AEW signs Lee Johnson. I think he's worthy of it. I think he's worthy of being all elite. Now, as far as these next two, remember when I said what happens sometimes to independent talent? You're either tested, you're showcased, or you're endured, or you're impressed. Uh, these guys, they just ended up in a brutal, brutal mess. As Musa and Brady Pierce took on the wild pit bulls and proud and Pablo of Inner Circle, Santana and Ortiz, and they put on a wrestling clinic. Literally, uh, Brady Pierce, I think, was a human crash test dummy at times. And the match, it ended with both men stuck up like Cornwood after a freaking street sweeper. And both men stepped on top of each other and Proud and Powerful picked up the win. Proud and Powerful has been part of the inner circle for so long, but their biggest victory was literally against the Young Bucks. They never capitalized off that. And it seems like they've been in mixed fortunes now. More shown for character development versus what they can actually do as victory-wise in the ring on Dynamite. But they are picking up these wins here on AEW Dark, so it makes me wonder, is there something more coming for them? And Musa and uh, Brady Pierce, uh, hey, now you know what it means to work with an effective tag team. Because, again, they wanted you to bring it. You just didn't bring it hard enough. What has been your thoughts on Proud and Powerful lately? I think, like, so I've been a fan of TNA, so, like, what Ortiz and them. So, like, I think Pedophil is going to, like, maybe face from the... Yeah, from Chris Jericho's team, Inner Circle. Yeah. And become only, like, maybe, like, Hany almost said, from, like, TNA will come join them as well. America change again, maybe. It's time with AEW after TNA. Hmm. I mean, it would be interesting to see Conan come back after Chris Jericho maybe drops them from the Inner Circle and forms his own fashion with them again. I don't know what Conan's even up to. So, yeah, that, that's some food for thought. And, again, Santana Ortiz, 
with this stacked in depth tag team division, you still got a lot to prove to work towards really trying to show us why you are as you scream, the best, the best, the best. But I digress. But speaking of other tag teams trying to impress and garner momentum, let's talk about the Butcher and the Blade. BB, without the other B, the Bunny. We'll talk more about her later. As Butcher and Blade took on Anthony Cartel, uh, Cartel, I apologize if I screw the last name, and Pineapple Pete. I don't know if Pineapple Pete thought he was doing some sort of shadow trick in Kung Fu at one time, and it was actually an effective maneuver. But Butcher and Blade, they are no nonsense. They carry him out here to do one thing, carry out full death. And they did. But Pineapple Pete, I'll give him credit. He tried to last. He tried to save his partner a couple of times. But Anthony, he suffered at the hands of Butcher and Blade, suffering full death towards the end. But Blade got some hard licks in on Pineapple Pete. I'm not sure what Pineapple Pete's future is from here, as he's still not signed. But he definitely has become the most noticeable character out of independent wrestling under AEW. I will say that. But hey, Butcher and Blade, easy win for them, carrying them in towards what we're going to talk about soon. Their match with... FTR in FTR's AEW Dynamite debut. Now, you briefly talked about Pineapple Pete, so maybe you can give me some more thoughts on what you think Pineapple Pete, what she should do from here to maybe garner a win. He's not got two losses under his belt. But give me also your thoughts on Butcher and Blade. So I think Butcher and Blade, it's like a warm-up match for them because they're going to play like a revival, a.k.a. the revival tomorrow. So it's like a warm-up match for against Pineapple Pete. Mm-hmm. So they don't have to try basically. Yeah? Right now, I think so. But for Pineapple Pete, like I said, I think Sean said it earlier in the topics. So like, if he said he fight Lee Johnson, I think Pineapple Pete will have his first win against Lee Johnson. Yeah? That, that might be the first one to fight Lee Johnson. Easy opponent. Pineapple Pete and Lee Johnson as a tag team could garner both men's first ever win. That's a very interesting idea considering how much character development and star power Pineapple Pete has thanks to Chris Jericho's constant berating of him. And Lee Johnson, a guy that's probably had more matches than any of these other independent talents, he's got to be due for a win. It would be a huge first step towards both these men, maybe becoming part of AEW. So I like that idea a lot. But you think about strange tag teams. Let's talk about strange alliances because I'm not sure what the end game he is here, but it looks like Ali has really been an influence in some way on one QT Marshall, who's now trying to show, and maybe we should go with these shirts, because maybe, you know, like, I'm the star player here. It's like Ali's trying to say, why do you play second field of Randy and Dustin? You're like, you know, just the addition to this trio. You should be the guy that should be on the front of the shirt. You should be the guy that's leading this trio. You should be the guy that should be leading this tag team to victory. It wasn't a tag team match, though. As QT Marshall took on, in his AEW debut, uh, Zach Clayton. Zach Clayton showed a lot of heel dynamics here at one point, going for the turnbuckle. Not very effective in pulling it off. And he had some uh, good offense here at this point. What was interesting, though, is initially it was QT and Allie coming out. Allie going to commentary. And then Dustin and Brandy reluctantly wearing that shirt that QT gave them through Allie's uh, graces. And then when QT was getting kind of messed up by uh, Zach, getting full of himself, but, you know, he laid himself open for a move. Allie came in and tried to offer, like, you know, a little encouragement or supported aid from commentary and went to ringside. Zach got into her face, and next thing you know, as the match continued, QT, he does got her some momentum back, but then there's, like, a little bit of an argument or disagreement between Allie and Brandy, particularly, as Dustin watches on. Eventually, Brandy, she tries to get involved on the apron, and QT's talking down to her. There was a bit of a miscommunication. Brandy falls, thankfully, on Dustin. However, Allie, I guess the wind must have gotten in her nail or something. I guess she broke a nail. QT went to go counsel her, and Brandy's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Anyway, QT goes back in the moving, nearly loses off of that distraction. Much to Zach's chagrin, he kicks out. As Zach tries to go for a top rope maneuver behind the uh, rest back, Allie slowly grabs Zach's foot, causes him to get distracted, and QT capitalizes with his red delicious cutter and picks up the win. Brandy and Dustin look on, Cat are just... Why? What's going on here? Where do you stand? As Ali and QT celebrate and are probably celebrating right now. So clearly, Ali is trying to break up or change the natural nightmares from the inside out. Or maybe she's trying to also grab the brandy too, based on events from last year. Don't get me started. In the inauguration of the AEW Women's Division. Bottom line here, QT and Ali, they continue to garner momentum. Natural nightmares might be on rocky soil. Don't know what Ali's endgame is here. Stay tuned for more. But this is now becoming a leading story on Dark and Subtly Outside the Audience on Dynamite. Tim, your thoughts on Ali and QT's partnership? I think QT Marshall and Ali is like Penelope Ford and 
kept saving. Like they're always with each other. Like always back up. Like you know, uh, like I when I was like a support system. Like you know how like Rebo was a support system with Danny Bryan, like on the ring. Yes. So that's how like I see it coming. Like so it's like a support system, you know, or mm. AKA relationship with each other behind wrestling. That's why. I feel like we're setting up eventually there's going to be so much internal turmoil that Brandy is going to force QT to choose. QT is going to choose Allie, and then we might get Allie versus Brandy because of this. QT in Allie's corner and Dustin in Brandy's corner. You further set up this separation idea. Dustin might be wondering what's going on with his tag team, and just when you think you can trust the bunny, she strikes. Ulterior motive, QT gets heartbroken. I think that's the end game here. I just think back to Hoodwick, that one line, never trust the bunny. This bunny's got many characters, many different sides to her, folks, okay? She could be Jessica Rabbit. She could be somebody else. She could be as clever as Bugs Bunny. Just saying. Mm-hmm. I, I, I followed Allie's career since Smash uh, Wrestling up in Canada. So I know that she could be very manipulative, very underhanding, but also very kind, very understanding, and could seem like a very innocent person. Mm-hmm. Do you all trust the bunny? I'll leave that to you to judge for now. Right now, me and Tim, we give you our thoughts for now. So I just, we'll I see just, what happens. I just bugged Bunny, but not her. <laughs> yeah, what's up, Doc? Uh, I, I, I actually, actually I meant to say Lola Bunny. And by the way, she dressed up as Lola Bunny one time for Halloween. Yowie, yeah. Wow. Uh, I, 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 sorry, 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 sorry. Go, go back to wrestling. Go on back to wrestling. Go on back to oh, wrestling. Not Halloween. Go on back to wrestling. She so she, she, she she channels a lot of bunny characters, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, I saw a picture of it on uh, Twitter and stuff like that. She's also yeah. into horror movies, too. She's so a what? So I think, I think Ellie's going to be the way she did on Impact. I wish she went back in the back on the wedding, I think so, on Impact. Oh, uh, yeah. Back. And yeah, that's right. She was like the little, um, you know, uh, happy to be here assistant. And then Braxton Sutter, her real life husband, I might add, also the Blade in AEW. They uh, came together. And next thing you know, uh, Laura Vaness, okay, Chelsea Green, she went crazy. And Allie was just, you know, happy go lucky. I don't know how far this is going to go. We'll see what happens here. I'm just glad to see Allie back on TV because she was one of my favorite signings to AEW. I'm glad they're finally doing something with her. And now we'll see what comes to it. I'm surprised she still hasn't wrestled, though. I wonder if she's really injured, to be honest with you. She hasn't wrestled in forever. But anyway. Okay. Enough about Allie and QT for now. Let's move on because I think about Sonny Kiss. He's one of those unique characters, but he's also a really good wrestler. But he really hasn't had a lot of time to shine on Dynamite outside spots maybe in a battle royale and slightly teaming up once in a while. He's been one of the rarest talents actually to show up on AW Dynamite. I wonder why. But here you really can see how much Sonny Kiss brings to the ring as he and Christopher Daniels, they went to the limit in a very good counter-for-counter match. It wasn't until the very end, though, where Sonny Kiss tries to go for a top maneuver, gets caught, and then Angels wins. Christopher Daniels wins. But this is actually probably my favorite match of the night, the well, second favorite match of the night. And again, when you look at Christopher Daniels, who feels reinvigorated now, he is one of the, the veterans of professional wrestling right now, going over 20-plus years. And in AEW, he feels, you know, reborn, okay? He loves what he's doing. He loves getting back in the ring, and he loves, like, basically bringing up the latest up-and-comers. Sonny Kiss got the whole career ahead of him, so... We'll see what happens here. What were your thoughts on this match? And more so, were you impressed with Sonny Kiss or Christopher Daniels? I think for me, Sonny Kiss, the last time she was in the thing was the Casino Barrera. Remember, like, way back at the Casino Barrera? I think the last time that Sonny Kiss was in there, that's the last time. Because right now she's on, like, behind the ramp, right? Behind the gates and stuff. So, like, or kind of repeat and stuff, like, cheering, cheering on other wrestlers. So, right. I think she has a lot of time in the, future as a wrestler still like you know she's probably young or something she has a lot of time she's still like there's her first match back since like casino battle royal and stuff so i think it was in the battle royal too to determine who would challenge uh cody first for the tnt championship but yeah that's been mostly a spot yeah mm-hmm. so she was like if the like when they had the like, joker's wild and stuff like that yeah so in the last yeah for the men's battle when the adam page was there and on the Joker, I guess so. so right. Yeah. What do you think about Christopher Daniels, though? Christopher Daniels, he's really impressing as a singles uh, star. He really feels like, you know, he got his uh, mojo back after being kicked in the face by Brody Lee. Yeah. I think Christopher Daniels is, is like, ahead of his game. I think he's going to maybe go for a title soon. Because if you look at the Christopher Daniels in TNA, like, a.k.a. Suicide and stuff, yeah. it's going to be, like, 
back to old Chris Vanden when he was at TNA, like two sides and stuff. Is the momentum good enough to go for a title shot or in the future? The TNT Championship is open challenge. I think Cody and him could have an incredible match. So again, you might be onto something, but we'll have to wait and see. But what? 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 Leva, get these two in line. What does she need to do? Marco Stump was involved in the match. I could have sworn one of them could fit him. No, it didn't happen. As once again, we continue the other, and I believe it is the longest running storyline in AEW Dark. Who is going to get the win first? But now, can they get the win together? I don't think either is going to happen at this point. And you know what I'm talking about. It's Peter Avalon and Brandon Cutler with Leva Bates as they took on Jurassic Express. The duo of Luchasaurus and, not Jungle Boy, Marco Stunt. There were a couple of key spots here if the two weren't bickering with each other that they really could have picked up the win as they controlled Marco's stunt. They even countered a double choke slam attempt by Luchasaurus. But miscommunication once again and bashing each other verbally. Peter Avalon, he suffers a wicked DDT and he looks off into I don't know what dimension as he was gay's die. And towards the end, assisted, I might add, choke slam by, by Jurassic Express with Marco's stunt. As Peter Avalon, he gets slammed into the mat, and Jurassic Express, both men pin Peter Avalon. One, two, three, Leva Bates, your plan is not working. Tim, I go to you on this. What do Peter Avalon and or Brandon Cutler have to do to get a freaking win? And do you see it happening? Ever? I don't think so. I can, I can see Lee Johnson get a win over both of them. Oh, God. <laughs> That's how bad. Because I think, like, bringing back my move before, like, the um, Peter Allen's girl was kissing Marco Stunt, like distracted from Marco Stunt. Yeah, so Marco Stunt got like, lucky. <laughs> yeah, but the kiss and stuff. So like, but I think Marco Stunt, Jurassic, wait, so Jurassic is one of my favorite tight teams right now over Private Party and stuff. So like, gotcha. actually, we just saw it's like a beast, you know, the way he like Marco Stunt, his injury is like awesome. So I don't think they're gonna get a win for a while. Uh, that poor <laughs> duo, and Leva, I know, suffering the worst because she has to endure now the verbal tirades of both men. Leva has to be the difference maker. I just don't know when or how. Good luck to you, Miss Bates. Oh, I, I think Leva's a distraction to the um the tag team. So I mean, if they have her, maybe they'll probably do something better. I feel like the tag team is more a distraction to themselves, and Leva's just trying to do what she can to help them. After all, she suddenly gets involved, like grabbing a book or simply trying to grab someone's leg. It's not like she really takes away from this team. The team just can't seem to get on the same page. And again, maybe this is just the internal beef with them because they don't stand each other, or maybe this is the fact that this is the way they just want to keep showing entertainment to us. I don't know. Do either men truly want the win at this point? I think as a wrestler, you do blur the line with character development and actual wrestling because both men, young wrestlers, both are capable of it. I feel like both men could pull up a win if they just could stop tiring each other. But who knows at this point? Anyway, moving on from there, let's go into the main event, as you briefly discussed, as Robert Anthony took on John Moxley, this match being 10 years in the Megan and Robert Anthony's second showing under AEW. His previous showing, of course, was tagging with Sean Spears on the search for Spears. He impressed me that day, showed a lot of strong in-ring characteristics, strong heel tactic, but again, Sean Spears blames him for a subtle miscommunication. Uh, you screwed up and left him to the wolves. We haven't seen him since. But apparently, these two have met each other before, long ago, under something known as CCW. Both men here, they showed a couple of things from that match, but they also lived and learned and showed a lot more. Not to mention, we had very strong play-by-play -play analysis by Taz, as John Moxley's future opponent for his title, the Machine Brian Cage, observed from the commentary position. Both of these men, they... I feel like we're really testing each other out. John Moxley more so testing out Robert Anthony scene. What have you learned? Have you improved? What have you brung? I feel like John Moxley could have put him away very quickly. He didn't. There was some soft spots. I feel like he was basically trying to show off some drip manipulation per se and literally controlling his opponent. And I feel like a couple of times it cost John Moxley some momentum. That death by drive out of nowhere by Robert Anthony, I thought was impressive. Uh, towards the end though, when Robert Anthony tries to go for a big power move, he gets caught in a power bomb. And then John Moxley tries to go for Gosh style power driver. That gets countered. Roll up counter into a Texas Clover lead. And Robert Anthony has no choice but to tap out. But the fact that he was very close to the ropes, I thought he was going to make it. I thought the match was going to continue. And hey, even uh, Taz was slightly impressed with how far Robert Anthony was going in this match. 
I thought this match was actually better than the first encounter, which you can watch on YouTube, folks. And again, John Moxley, he continues garnering momentum as we head towards Spider Fest. It was probably my favorite match of the night. Slow pace, but it was a good story. And Robert Anthony, he's one of those that I feel like he and John Moxley can definitely see each other again. And Robert Anthony, I feel like uh, he's got a bright future ahead of him, wherever he ends up. Your thoughts on this match? I, I feel like the story between Robert Anthony and and, and John Dean Moxley. Ambrose and Jay, John Moxley is not over. It's gonna it's a, at the beginning of the story from like ten years ago. So I think it's, it's like even after Fight Pass, all there's gonna be a match between them eventually. Come off a title or a tag team. That'd be good. Cool. That'd be good if they were tag team too. That so is they, very they, true. I mean. I, I think John Moxley, though, he's a guy that will take on the world by himself. I don't see that ever happening, just saying. But, uh, yeah, I would not mind seeing these two face each other again or more of Robert Anthony. Again, this is only his second match, folks, in AEW, technically. He's zero on two, but, hey, he's got some uh, good uh, match qualities under his belt. We'll see what happens when he's brought back. Only time will tell. With that being said, that was AEW Dark. Great showcase. And then we talk about the card, so we're going to just go right into it as we got this week's AEW Dynamite. Let's go ahead and break into this because, once again, stacked card, a lot of firsts here, and, of course, a lot garnering off the events of last week's AEW Dynamite. Let's go ahead and look at this first match here because this was going to be interesting. But also, it might be the one that I'm like, this seems obvious. I don't think it's going to lead to anything. Let's see what happens. He wants to prove that he's more than just a fun guy to have. He's a wrestler. He can pick up wins. Well, he still has not. Last week, he took on La Travaillon, Chris Jericho. You know who I'm talking about, Coca Cabana. Oh, and Coca Cabana was then approached oh. by the Dark Order to join us. I can make you extraordinary. I can make you a winner. You wonder now if that's ever going to cloud, continue to cloud his judgment, even though he did, in fact, he said, apparently, I'm never getting involved with that. But again, a week could change you. Can this match change him as he takes on the Spanish god, Sammy Guevara? And I thought he was still on that scooter. The only thing we know about Sammy up to this point is that Party Hardy, we'll talk more about that in a little bit, he respects him, whatever that means. I don't know if Broken Hardy respects him, but I guess Party Hardy does. So looking at this match here, I'm just thinking it like this. Sammy Guevara is one of the highest rising young stars in AEW. Just look at his feuds with Darby Allin. This matches with Kenny Omega, just saying. Coca Mana, he's already an established veteran. But honestly, he has a very mixed record right now when it comes to AEW. And I also feel like he's just in a position he doesn't know where to be right now besides helping SCU against the Dark Order. So maybe this is just foreshadowing of him working with SCU to take on the Dark Order in a massive tag match. But I feel like Cabana is going to lose this one, and I'm going with Sammy Guevara on this. What are your thoughts on Cabana? Do you think he should join the Dark Order? Or more so, do you think he's going to win against Sammy Guevara? I don't think he's going to win because... Like, as I was saying, like, he's going to go for the New Japan tournament, right? Is there, like, a better way to come out tournament for New Japan? Uh, Kokobana has been involved in the New Japan Cup. He was originally supposed yeah. to be in the other one, but, of course, the world went on lockdown. But, yes, you're right. Kokobana has been through New Japan Pro Wrestling. Mm -hmm. I think he's going to lose and get rid of the New – basically, it's, like, he's going to lose automatically. Semi or, I think Simi Guevara has title chance against Cody in the future for the TNT championship after Mark – yeah. Okay. And, okay, and that would definitely uh, got our momentum. And again, open challenge. Who knows who's next? Well, we do know who's next. So let's go ahead and briefly talk about that. As it may be the only title match on the show, I don't know if it's going to close the show, but so far, I am enjoying what the TNT Championship matches are bringing. As last week, we had an old school type main event match for a title as Cody, the TNT champion, defended against Jungle Boy. In a very old school match, this match had strong back and forth action, good pace, a couple of crazy spots. There was blood. Cody got messed up. Arn Anderson was, of course, in the corner. Co uh, Jungle Boy shows a lot of promise, and I'm really glad he's finally being showcased. It was probably his biggest match to date, and Cody has massive respect for him, as was shown afterwards. But in the end, Cody, he does pull off a crossroads for the win. A very strong effort by Jungle Boy. I would not be surprised to see these two guys each other again. However, I can't argue the fact that during this match, Jungle Boy was being berated by MJF, so I feel like that feud is long from over, and MJF, he's soon to challenge both Jungle Boy and Cody again. He might challenge Cody for this title, too. We saw his design of the friggin' Burberry leather yuck, belt. I don't think I want to see that. But with that being said, this week now, Cody, as he continues his every week open challenge, 
he will be taking on not Ray Phoenix as it was botched on commentary because apparently Ray Phoenix, his injuries are a little more than originally anticipated. Get well soon. He has taken on one half of Private Party and I believe this man's first ever singles match in AEW, Mark Kwan. We know what Mark Kwan is capable of as he and Isaiah Cassidy are a very promising tag team in Private Party in AEW. They beat the Young Bucks, simple as that. They already are that over. They got strong character development behind them. People are invested in this team. And Matt Hardy, he likes this team. And who knows, with Party Hardy, this might become a new trios for something you want on the line that might happen. But give me your thoughts on this, because I think about Cody putting out this open challenge every week. you got to think about who's going to take the title off him. Who's going to be the one to do it? How's it going to happen? This is going to be a traditional championship title match on AEW Dynamite. Cody, I feel like it's going to have a long run with this, and I feel like it some people, it probably defeats the purpose of them watching it. However, I look at the fact Cody, he is basically building the future. In every match he's in, he's trying to put over the person he's with. He's done it with MJF. He's done it with Jungle Boy. He did it with Sammy Guevara in the freaking A.W. Dynamite debut. And now we get to see what Mark Kwan can bring as a singles versus a tag team. It's amazing how far A.W. goes to show you how well tag teams work not only together, but as individuals. And I feel like this match is going to be the first stepping stone to prove that with Mark Juan, who people only know as one half of Private Party. Give me your thoughts on this match. I don't think Cody's going to lose his title. I think if, like, it was against Fien- um, Pentagon Jr., maybe. Hmm. Pentagon Jr. have a chance when he comes back with the Because I think, like, they lost some momentum. Mark Juan and Isaiah Cassidy mm-hmm. lost some momentum after they lost against best friends at all or nothing. So, like, the momentum went down. So, it's probably, like, a back turn. Some, like, interference in the match, probably. Okay. So, so you're, you're looking at a longer run here. You're thinking that since Ray Phoenix wasn't involved here, eventually he'll return. He'll exact maybe some vengeance, go after Cody for the title. Because, again, Cody, he made himself a prime target. But, yeah, I, I agree that Mark Juan is the not going to win here. But, again, it's going to be his first singles match in AW Dynamite. I'm expecting him to impress. And I feel like he's going to go the distance with Cody. I don't know necessarily this will be as long as the match with Jungle Boy because Mark Quinn, he's more faster and agile versus Cody, who's more old-school, ground-based type wrestler. Though we know Cody can pull up a moonsault. This is going to be a very interesting match, and I'm curious to see how they uh, pull this off. But speaking of uh, pulling something off, is it amazing how Chris Jericho just seems to just seamlessly go in the commentary and own it? Because now we're getting that back as Chris Jericho will be on commentary this week because his inner circle buddies will be taking on the team of the number one contenders for the AW Tag Team Championships, Best Friends, and Orange Cassidy. Now, why is this match happening? Simple. <laughs> Last week after Chris Jericho beat Kukubana, he literally called out Mike Tyson, the toughest, baddest man on the planet. He also called him a piece of shit. Harsh words. He wants to challenge him. He wants to take on the most dangerous man. Who comes out? Q Orange Cassidy, who, of course, remembers the events of the week before last week, where freaking Inner Circle attacked him before entering that battle royale for the number one contendership to TNT Championship. So now, what does Orange Cassidy do? Subtle mind games. He comes in the ring places the hands of Jericho in Jericho's belt pockets and then places his own hands in his pockets. Jericho laughs. Hager looks on. He plays a little bit of an evasive game, gets under Jericho's skin, and just slowly flows into the eyes into the best friend's arms, who I might add are your number one contenders for the AW Tag Team Championships. So now we got the six-man tag as Proud and Powerful and Jake Hager fight on Le Trumpion's behalf and take on best friends in Orange Cassidy. You know Chris Jericho's going to do two things on commentary. He's going to insult the hell out of Orange Cassidy, and he's going to keep berating Mike Tyson. The bottom line, though, is this. With the momentum the best friends have with them, there's no way I see them losing this match, unfortunately. And that means that the inner circle will be losing at the expense of them. And I feel like it's just going to send Chris Jericho into a furious verbal tirade against Orange Cassidy and say, if Mike Tyson was here, inner circle, we'd be able to beat him completely. Tim, give me your thoughts on this tirade Chris Jericho has against Mike Tyson and the idea that we might be getting Orange Cassidy versus Chris Jericho. I think we're going to get Orange Cassidy versus, after Fighter Fest. Because remember, isn't it like Chris Jericho versus Mike Tyson after Fighter Fest? Or I don't know. 
It's not official, but it seems that's the direction AEW might be going as Chris Jericho does keep calling out Mike Tyson. And, ladies and gentlemen, Fighter Fest will not be a free individual type pay-per-view form. It will be special Dynamite two-week event, July 1st and July 8th, where all the titles in AEW will be defended. And that's as much as we know. Anyway, continue. Yeah, it's on my birthday. Fighter Fest is on my birthday, actually. Speaking of that. Oh, nice. Yeah, July 1st is my birthday, so it's like... So it'd be like special birthday gift. <laughs> <It's> like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> the best one. Yeah, but like I think Orange Cassidy is like in the future, but not yet. Not maybe yet. For Chris Jericho. Like I see, I can see in the future against each other. Okay. After them after the matter. But best friends, again the momentum. They're ready for to take the tethers away from Ken Omega and Pay 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 Pay. Pay. So, Yeah. Okay. Let's go ahead and talk about the tag team champions for a moment because they were in action last week. I don't know about you, but Super Bad Squad, I feel like, again, Jimmy Havoc more so carries that team. Kip Salmon, I feel like, is still more eagle than in ring action. However, I thought he and Havoc did work very well last week in last week's opener, which was a tag team championship match. And they did use everything against the champs, including Ford and a wrench. Eventually, Penelope Ford, she did get ejected from the ring. And now we know what it's finally called, the last call. Buckshot, Lariat, Beach Recombination, the champs did retain. But give me your thoughts on this. Omega and Heyman and Page, how have you been as far as impressed by them, or what's your critique of them as a tag team? I think they're a good tag team so far, but like when they face um, Private Party, was it Private Party? They lost to Ray? I'm sorry. No. I'm sorry. Uh, they, lost- they, they have faced Private Party before, though, yeah. Yeah, back in Boston, I think so. So I think. I think they changed like got momentum from back then when they faced Private Party in the tournament. So we'll see how how they come up or we'll see how Dakota and the Fizz. Yeah. I, I just think about this, okay? All tiles are defended, so we know we're getting at Fighter Fest. It's gonna be the best friends versus Hangman Ad Page and Kenny Omega. Are the best friends the tag team to take the titles off the tag team champions? Now I just want to give your idea on this. I don't necessarily want a prediction because I'm sure you and I will predict on this as we get closer to Fighter Fest when this has actually happened. But you think about how long these tag champs have held these tiles. You think about the rocky ground they started teasing a breakup. And then after Stam Stampede, it's like we're on the same page. We're good. The elite's back to normal. But best friends, they have carried the AEW tag team division this entire quarantine time and really have impressed the most. Now they have basically everything behind them. This is their opportunity. Is this where they capitalize, or was all this for naught? Do you think that the best friends are the next tag team champions to happen? I think they have a good chance of taking the. I think it's time up for Kanemi again and Adam Page. I think the best friends have a good chance of taking it over, like which is over Jungle Express or Private Party or any other tag team that's in AW right now. So. Like, the problem, the pro- I don't know what you call it a problem. I call it its greatest strength. The fact that AEW puts so much into tag team wrestling, their tag team division, to the point it's a focal point in storylines and main events, it's absolutely incredible. And all of these teams, none of them feel the same. They all could be tag team champions at some point. But here we are with this strange Bethel team of Kenny Omega and Heyman and Adam Page that weren't even a team to begin with, just two singles competitors. They are leading the division, and now they're going to face the best friends at Firefest. That's going to be an amazing match. But can it top AEW Revolution? I don't think so just because of story value. But this is going to be a very competitive bout. And again, Orange Cassidy, he's going to be the wild factor, I feel like. This might be the most uh, effort Orange Cassidy puts into something, helping the best friends actually get the tag team titles. Unless... He literally has the best friends go out and do it on their own or try and do it on their own. Because, again, he's telling the coach, the manager. I don't know. We'll have to see how Orange Cassidy feels about this. I would love to get his opinion on this. But pff, talking to that guy would be like talking to a brick wall. Anyway. <laughs> oh, come on. You know I'm right. But anyway, be, going uh, back. Be like, be like talking but, to Goldust. Remember Goldust when he did the gimmick, like the weird voice? I tell Orange yeah. oh, Cassidy going to do soon. Like ah. another Goldust back in WWE with the weird voice and stuff, you know? I mean, that's potential. Absolutely, potential. Okay, (laughs) let's go ahead and talk about this real quick before we talk about more matches for Dynamite this week. Uh, Last week, first off, Sean Spears, he got berated by Tully Blanchard to the point that Tully, he will drop him if he doesn't change. However, Tully seems to now be taking things into his own hands. He was trying to see if Sean really can do something on his own, but it seems like something went amiss. 
He needs to find something for Sean Spears to get that momentum, get the wins back, get the seriousness back. So what does he do? We find the man in an SUV, and he gives him the missing piece in a black leather glove, and Sean Spears smiles. A single black leather glove, I might add. So I have no idea what to think about this, this black leather glove. Is this going to be like a thing where it's like a special type loaded glove or like some sort of design where it's like loaded punch now gives you the win like a KO punch? Is he going to use this for some sort of joint manipulation? What, what, what's going on here? Is it going to be more of a methodical type, you know, person in the ring with style? What are your thoughts right now on Tully's missing piece to Sean Spears? I think for me, Sean Spears, if you look at WWE back then, like Ty Jones, a.k.a., what did he do in WWE, Sean, a.k.a. Sean Spears right now? Like, it's the same Sean Spears that happened before. He did nothing. Mm-hmm. I think Tully Branch is like the perfect manager for Sean Spears to get momentum in Sean Spears to win, have a match, have a victory over someone else. I think so. Well, I'm sure Sean Spears is going to face an independent talent. It might even be this week. Nothing's been made official. But I'm just curious what that glove's going to do. Is it going to cause him to put in a new attitude? Is it going to be a new finisher? Is Tully going to be out there with him to tell him what to do now? Because Tully has not been in his corner for weeks. Something's got to yeah. change with Sean Spears, and I think it starts this week. We'll have to wait and see. But speaking of change, it looks like something might have changed, but not necessarily for the better. For the worse. Alex Marvez went out, and he went out to get a word with Lance Archer coming off the loss to Cody back at Double or Nothing for the inaugural TNT Championship. And we find Lance Archer basically says, you think one loss changes what I'm about? You think one loss derails me? Like I said, everybody dies, and I'm going to prove it. I'm going to bring more violence than ever. What's interesting, though, is his mouthpiece that's been Jake Snake Roberts, or Jake Roberts, they just call him, he basically was just looking on, kind of in uh, terror and worry. And then he just told Alex Marvez, I'm sorry. So is Jake losing control of Lance, or is Jake and Lance bringing something more devious now to AEW? What's going on here? Your thoughts on Lance Archer and his direction? I think he's going more devious because I spoke to um, Lance Foy on Instagram. So he said he has a plan coming. So, has AKA Lance Archer, Lance Foy. So, I think he has a plan coming with the devious plan. Hmm. Well, I guess we'll have to uh, wait and see uh, on that. But speaking of plans, it seems like clearly Taz has a plan for John Moxley. As once again, Taz and Cage. They showed off in ring on the mic as Cage took on Sean Dean and literally destroyed the guy. Pulling off once again, big time airplane spin and then drill call, short match. That was it. He was done. And then Taz, he grabs the mics, talks about that was fun. Talks about, you know what's not going to be fun, John Moxie, why you think this is a joke? The machine, Brian Cage. He's not a joke. He's going to destroy you. He's going to hurt you. And he's going to take that AW championship from you. Beat him if you can. Survive if he lets you. Hugh John Moxley, who comes out and says, I'm not taking it as a joke, but this is fun. This is what I love. This is professional wrestling. I respect that. But he also said, Brian Cage, I'm aware of what you are, but you might not be aware of what I am. Be aware that when it comes to me and that bell rings and it's for this, you're stepping in the ring with a totally different shark. Again, John Moxley went from subtle, humor, humble, fun, content, looking forward to the match to... Don't take me lightly. I'm a serious threat. I am the toughest SOB in this company, and you're going to learn firsthand. Brian Cage, no words, looks on, no action. I can't wait to see these two confront each other, and John Moxley will be defending this title against Brian Cage at Fighter Fest, either July 1st or July 8th. And I feel like right now, both men, they really don't need to do any more promos. They've already built the match. Now we just need like a road to type video of how John Moxley's training for this and how Taz is fine-tuning Brian Cage for this. I don't think any more, like, in-ring type banter needs to be shared among the men. I feel like at this point, it's just get ready for go time, bros. What's your thoughts on Brian Cage's presentation so far and Taz as his manager? I think it's like a momentum because an impact, you go to, remember you want, you lost a like, of Blanchard for the title? So there's like That's a momentum to, like, to win the title against um, Moxie, probably. A momentum. And Jason says to get a momentum. Tries to give yeah. momentum as a manager, so I think he has a better chance to win it. Or, or well, he definitely match. has a 
he hasn't said a single word yet, nor has done a promo. So clearly they're preserving him just as this, like Taz says, he is not human. He is a freaking machine. So okay. we'll, we'll see how far this goes and how far John Moxley can push these two to the point Brian Cage actually says something. That's what I'm waiting for. That's probably the only thing left to do in this build. But then again, does Brian Cage need to speak? Maybe not. <clears throat> he's, like a, he's like a war machine now. You got Rhino. That's running through everybody. Basically. True, but he's not goring people. He's drill clawing them, and that's a whole different thing. Pile driver. Uh, yeah. With that being said, let's go ahead. And by the way, let me just get this out of the way right now, okay? I feel like it's self-said, but mad respect, AEW. Love the opening match, uh, message. Black Lives Matter. People, we're all equal. Respect one another. Let's heal the world. Let's not continue to ruin it. Okay? Simple as that. Anyway, moving on from there, let's go ahead and look at the women's division. As we see Dr. Britt Baker in her Rolls Royce, the most souped-up golf cart I've ever seen, with her assistant, I guess driver too, uh, the Rebel, uh, she is watching on from the audience, and she watches on as we look at Big Swole versus Nyla Rose. This, of course, is picking up after Big Swole confronted Nyla Rose when she was champion, and it never capitalized. And this is Big Swole's first in-ring match return since the world went into lockdown. But before this, let me also add, I did not know you could work so hard while in a freaking wheelchair. That training montage with the changed out weights and, you know, the help, and, of course, the support not only from her assistant, Rebel, but the trainers and Tony Schiavone, which I thought was very interesting. Maybe they are best friends. I thought that was very humorous. And who knows? She might be on the road to recovery quicker than we think. I'm just going to say that right now. But before I talk about this match and what I think might be next for women's division, give me your thoughts on Britt Baker in general. I think my thoughts on Britt Baker is like, she's like, do you watch the, her video, like her live thing? I think she's ready to call Adam Cohen. Like the way she's like, the Adam Cole left. Like once I think once Adam Cole leaves, NXT is probably gonna come in because of Britt Baker. Like so, oh. like momentum Man. to bring Adam Cole and like after he loses the title. Well, 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 you know the old saying: "Love is a battlefield." They're owning both companies in their own way, two different worlds, one family. We'll see what happens. Shout out to the cons. Anyway, we go into this match. Big Swell now arose. They got a lot of good time in here. It was a little slow paced. There was a couple of messed up spots I did see, but Big Swole, she really tried to show why she's in AEW. She's a great wrestler. In the end, Nyla Rose, she does continue her momentum as, of course, Big Swole got caught in the beast bomb, and Nyla Rose, and Jerry even says, Nyla Rose is the most dangerous, intimidating threat still in the AEW Women's Division, as the Carl Sheeta, the current AEW Women's Champion, looked on from the audience. But what's interesting here, I think about afterwards, Big Swole, Tony Giovanni goes get some words with her, or tries to, and think about, this is your first match in a long time. You did come up on the losing end. Tell me for your thoughts. She's kind of tired of losing, but she's not giving up on herself. And it looks like she was trying to share some subtleties from a past rival she was also picking up with, Britt Baker, that Britt basically took over, thinking, oh, you want to put my name in your mouth? Hey, pull me up, pull me up. Next thing you know, up the barricade, to the barricade, the Rolls Royce gets pulled up, and she's literally tirading Big Swole. But Big Swole, she's somebody you do not want to get up in someone's face, as mm -hmm. MJS facial expressions showed. As she went to go grab a chair, Britt Baker said, no, I'm injured, I'm injured. And it looked like she legitimately was going to use that chair on Britt Baker's legs. Next thing you know, Rebel pulls her all the way back, and Big Swole jumps the barricade, throws the chair, and MJF's just looking on like, whoa, okay. So, oh but... But bottom line is this. I think Big Swole versus Britt Baker is the match that's going to be set up for All Out. Because, again, Britt Baker, she's due to return it All Out. I don't think these two are done with each other by a long shot, especially when it comes to a war of words. Oof. For my prediction, I think Big Swole is going to team up with Awesome Kong in the future. I think so. Oh, I, okay. Because if you look at the casino battle row between when they had the ODB with all the big four women in the middle. Yes. And like Big Swole interfered. I think Awesome Kong's gonna come back and like have a match with Nyla Nairos in the future. I think so. Well, it's I don't know if she's still I don't know if she's still doing glow or is on a lockdown, but that it does give that does give you uh food for thought as I do think about when she is coming back. And there are so many other women in AEW that you know aren't being there right now because of quarantine. 
So, hey, that might be an interesting way to bring her back, especially since she was kicked out of that Mel union or whatever. So, okay, we'll see what happens. But speaking of the women's division, we also are still trying to figure out who is going to challenge Akash Shida at Fighter Fest for the women's title. This tag match that Tony Khan officially broke out on Twitter, it might lead something towards that. As tomorrow, we have <clears throat> Chris Statlander and, uh, excuse me, uh, Hikaru Shida, the champion, in tag team action. This duo, you know very well. They've had mixed fortunes as a team, but they also seem like best friends. And they're facing the duo of Nyla Rose and Penelope Ford. So I think about this. Are we on the verge of a double or nothing rematch so soon? Or... Is Penelope Ford finally going to break away from this stigma of, okay, she's just, you know, Kip Sabian's uh, girl. She's the super bad girl. Is she really going to try and break away, pull up some weird, miraculous roll-up win here, and somehow we get Penelope Ford versus Kyle Sheena for the title? Or are we just going to get a strong, competitive, friendly bout between the friends of Chris Statlander and Kyle Sheena? Two amazing wrestlers and personalities. I feel like they both could have an incredible match. But I don't know of how many title matches Chris Statlander has had, especially uh, with Nyla Rose, for example. Do you put her in another title match just for her to be set up for maybe losing? Because I got to be honest with you. When I look at all these champions, and right now I think AEW has the best roster of champions. There, I said it. I feel like Akira Shida is going to be the one to hold the title the longest. She's literally been called the Kenny Omega of the women's division, okay? Simple as that. It's going to take someone super momentous, great in the ring, and great character to take that title off her. And I don't see them simply doing a, you know, a handoff to Nyla Rose. And I feel like Britt Baker has to be the end game because she's the only one I feel like her rival, especially from a character standpoint. Hikaru Shida, we've seen it firsthand when they went one-on-one, -on -one, and the freaking match ended up becoming a brand-new T-shirt and the best-selling T-shirt on Pro Wrestling Tees for our women. Congratulations, Britt Baker. So, Tim, give me your thoughts on the direction of the women's division. Do you think this tag match will lead to figuring out who will challenge Hikaru Shida for the women's title at Fighter Fest? I think so, because I think, like, like you said, she does, like, a... a she does long win the championship, but like, I think she does like a Bailey. I think she could hold the title, break the record for like the title for a woman's championship oh. right now. All right. Uh, and Sasha Banks just won the tag team championship, but like, I think she did could be like a Bailey if you compare her to like any other person in WWE or anything. So well, like, now I, the, now, well, now I know you're favorite from WWE, but hey, I, I'll give you credit. You're absolutely Bailey. I mean, no. she has held her title for a long time, so she's you're not, definitely onto something not, there. But who, who, who do you see challenging Hikaru Shida potentially at Fighter Fest? I think Penelope Ford has it. If they push her, yeah, give her momentum. I think she has a good chance to try to get Fighter Fest. Even though she's uh, the underdog, she's the underdog in the match. I think she has a chance to challenge Shida from a match. Well, I mean, she is. She did finally break in the fruit into the rankings, so you might be onto something there. And for those of you who are wanting AEW, they do rankings on a week by week basis based on win loss record, match quality, and overall wrestler just in general. She is number five, record of three and three. Number one, still Nyla Rose, five and two. Chris Stantley is four and four. And Dr. Britt Baker is four and four at number three. And then Yuka is one and one. But she does record, hard to beat, 11 and 1. Just saying. And these are as of June 3rd. They'll have the new records, obviously, on uh, June 10th. Okay, so with that being said, we basically talked about everything except for one thing. And the reason I saved this for last is because this has got to be the biggest change to AEW's environment. It certainly is the biggest change for tag team wrestling as FTR, and you could guess to yourself what it stands for. They just say, you know, it just goes for everything. It just stands for our top guys because they are the top guys. FTR are now part of AEW, and after a sit-down with Tony Schiavone, where they try to talk about why they join AEW, what are your, like, motives? What do you uh, want to do here? And basically, they just want to prove that they are the best in tag team wrestling. They, they name-drop a lot of tag teams that they really want to get in the ring with, and they do have a uh, subtle respect for, including but not limited to... Um, let me think here. At TH2, they're like, that's a team we would love to face. Uh, BNB, they're another tag team that'd be great to uh, face. And there are so many tag teams right now that are here. But the dream match everybody's been waiting for, it's not a dream match to us because the one team they didn't say was the Young Bucks. We've had to sit back and listen to Dave Meltzer sing their praises. And there's the next Midnight Express. Tony, do you think that makes us happy? 
And then Jack Cash says, I want to punch them in the mouth. So I think we know what this might be uh, setting up for. Because again, tag team wrestling, it's a way of life for FTR. Now they're in AEW, the pinnacle of the wrestling revolution. Their words, unquote. Thank you, AllEatWrestling.com. So with that being said, they mentioned many great tag teams, but not this one, as we finally get some follow-up to their debut and their initial attack on BB, who won a piece of them. However, they explained what we did to you. It was not personal. It was just business. So let's go to the ring and sell it like businessmen, because that's where we do our business. Then he tosses water at one of them, and then they walk out and says, we'll see you next week. FTR, out. So here we are in FTR's AEW Dynamite debut. They take on the Butcher and the Blade. Who knows what sort of tag team wrestling we can expect from this match and what these two are going to bring and where they go from here and what next team will be on their radar. Is this a one-time thing? Is this a long-term ending rivalry? Only time will tell. But I am not going against FTR in their AEW Dynamite debut, losing to Butcher and Blade, who I might add, they do go on a great momentum lately on AEW Dark. But they have not been in action on AEW Dynamite in such a long time. With that being said, I'm actually looking forward to this match the most this week because I'm a huge FTR fan, as you call them, formerly known as The Revival. And I feel like right now it's a brand new start for them. I can't wait to see what they bring to the company with the deepest tag team division in the business, bar none. Tim, your thoughts on FTR and this match? I think it's the bigger one, definitely. Because the last time Butcher Boy was on Dynamite was against Jungle Express, right? Like a while ago. So, like. That's correct. Yeah, so I think FTR is going to, like, maybe it's going to be a close match, but I think FTR is going to run with it, the match. Yeah, time, and, so. and, and I wonder, you, you look at last week when uh, Young Bucks and Barty Hardy, excuse me, uh, they, they, you know, you look at when uh, there was tag team wrestling last week, excuse me, with Botch, sorry, ladies and gentlemen, when Kenny Omega and Heyman and Page, they were defending the tag team titles against Kip Sabian and Jimmy Havoc. They looked around, the audience, the audience was watching on, who was up in the bleachers watching on? FTR. You know clearly who they're gunning for or what they're gunning for. FTR versus Heyman and Page and Kenny Omega, that right there is a tag team championship match that might actually happen. Is it waiting to happen? I don't know. Can the tag champs go that far? Again, they're 6-0 and right now. They're, they're undefeated. But tag team rankings, best friends 9-3, uh, Natural Nightmares 5-0, and Private Party 4-2, and uh, the Super Bad Squad 3-1, and and Young Bucks still somehow on the freaking uh, rankings. Number five, they are 2-2. Two and two. And the tag team rankings are the ones that seem to change every week because, again, it's the one they focus on the most and it seems to be the one that always seems to change direction, okay? So we'll have to uh, wait and see. But bottom line is this. FTR, it's going to be an interesting match. I just don't see them losing. But I don't see this being the only time BB goes after them because the fact that BB just brought in out of nowhere to take on these guys after trying to go after the Young Bucks, there's got to be something more going on here. And again, it goes back to Allie. And I think Allie's going to be a real pickup for BB's uh, tag team run in AEW, if they haven't been already. But with that being said, that's everything we know as of right now, as far as All Elite Wrestling and this episode of AEW uh, Dynamite. I don't think Mike Tyson's going to show up. I still feel like we're going to have like a number one contenders match to figure out who's going to challenge Akash Shida for the AEW Women's Championship. And as far as who could challenge Cody next for the TNT Championship, pff, your guess is as good as mine. I mean, you did mention a name like Sammy Guevara. Heck, it might be Jake Hager. It might be freaking Darby Allen. But speaking of which, I almost forgot. Darby Allen, he was unable to compete last week because of what Brian Cage did to him back at Double or Nothing. However, he did have some subtle comments based on the fact that doctors would not let him do what he loves, and that is freaking wrestle. It sounds like to me he threw an Subtle warning to the machine, Brian Cage, as he simply said, life's one big joke. However, Brian Cage, I'll get the last laugh. I feel like Brian Cage is going to show up this week in promo form and send out a message to the machine. And I feel like he and Brian Cage are going to have a match before Brian Cage takes John Moxley on at Firefly. But that's just my subtle opinion. As far as events, I think that are bound to happen. And other stuff that I think 
might not happen. And, and I also feel like that Ali and QT, they're going to show up tomorrow on AEW Diamond in the crowd. Brandy's going to be annoyed. And we'll get some more substitutes there as this story seems to be carrying over more on Dark. Maybe we'll also get more about the Dark Order, considering now we got a new member, number five, and Alan Angels, which I still am play shocked about. And by the way, for those of you who are wanting the men's rankings, MJF 6-0, Lance Archer 5-1, Mr. Broy Lee 5-1, Kenny Omega 4-0, Darby Allen 6-4, the champs 10-1 with Cody, John Moxley 12-0. And I have a feeling we're going to see some big changes come to the rankings on June 10th. And that's all I have to say about that. Tim, do you have any final thoughts regarding what you think might happen tomorrow on Dynamite? What might be set up at Fire Fest and what you want to see on Dynamite? I think after the like mess Cody's gonna have with Makaku, I think Pentagon should come back because he hasn't been for wrestling for a while. I think he's gonna make a debut against the title sooner or later. Because yeah. where, where has he been? Like Pentagon Junior. In like, Mexico. Has been off... Yeah, he but he's been off the Blanchard, I've been stuck in Mexico. Yeah, so maybe once this thing comes up, maybe he'll be back. Or if they do an international show, maybe he'll come back and do like. Uh, the tail and Cody in the future. I can see him coming back. Okay, yeah. that's fair. So you're talking about long run, who you think might take the title of uh, Cody for the TNT title. I'm just going to ask you this. Who do you think is going to challenge Cody for the TNT championship next? I want, I want Luchasaurus to get the title. Actually. Oh, God. <laughs> I think so. Biggest. Yeah, but... But I think they're going like, to make a feud with Luchasaurus and Willow in the future. So I think Luchasaurus has to get ready for a feud in a future match with Willow. I think so. Okay. You know, it, surpri it, it surprised me if they pick up anything else with MJF and Jungle Boy. As MJF, he's just, you know, watching on from the crowd right now. I wonder if he's going to berate Cody this week at all. Is MJF going to come back after Cody for the TNT title? Is he going to insert himself into this picture? Or is he a Wardlow on the uh, same page? What are your thoughts right now with MJF and Wardlow since they're, you know? I think, I think they're going to split. At the fight of, at fight of first, they're going to split against each other. I think so. At Fighter Fest? Whoa. Are you saying that Cody's going to defend the title against MJF at Fighter Fest? No, like, well, MJF's going to split. I think so. As, as, as a team. I think so. Okay. okay. I, well, I think I that's think fair. I mean, it's a fair analysis. I'm, I'm not going to say you're wrong. I, again, it's entirely possible. Anything's possible. The thing about AEW, it's a bell-to-bell -bell wrestling company with merit. It's everyone's out there for each other, trying to make each other better. We truly don't know what's going to happen, and it has surprised us. And I have a feeling, despite the fact we got, like, five matches known and Chris Jericho on commentary, there's going to be some other big angle to go down. Maybe we'll learn more about Sean Spears' glove. Darby Allen, like, like I said, he might pose a challenge. Is Britt Bigger going to come back and give us rule number four of being a role model? Is it going to be something about don't intimidate the role model? Is Big Swole is going to call out Britt Baker for a match at All Out? There's a lot of, right now, open discussion and open land field as far as AW goes. Is Lance Archer going to show up tomorrow and destroy somebody? <laughs> He's going to destroy his house first, you know, after he destroyed everything else, maybe. So. I, I'm, 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 worried, I'm worried about the audience at this point. That's all I got to say about that. The audience, I think, is going to suffer at the hands of Lance Archer because, again, Alex Marvez, that was a very uncomfortable situation that he was in. I almost feel bad for the guy. All right. Well, okay. I think with that being said, I think we've about shared, discussed, reviewed, and previewed, and thought about everything we can about All Elite Wrestling and AEW in the short run. So with that being said, Tim, any further thoughts, questions, or closing remarks as we might end this discussion? It was a good, it was a good time. I had a blessed, blessed time with you on the A and W Spark, actually. All right, well, so awesome. about that. Bottom line, folks, he and I, we're with All Elite Wrestling, and we look forward to AEW and what Dynamite brings tomorrow. With that being said, I think that pretty much closes the show here. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for tuning in to another edition of AEW Spark. Tim, again, I'm glad you had fun. This was actually a pleasure. Let's definitely do this again in the future. Is there anything you want to plug or promote or where people like find you to talk about wrestling with you? No, but like I just promote a challenge page. I know just promote we want wrestling wrestling discussions. Like get right. more followers to follow them, you know? Simple as that. Follow for wrestling discussions. And, uh, and Mark Griffin's page, yeah, all wrestling. So promote those pages. 
I certainly will, as I always do in the description. Simple as that. Well, thank you, Tim. Very humble. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to know more about me, know this. I'm just a simple man, a lifelong fan of wrestling. Twitter, notiq.com forward slash Noah. Instagram, Adam Foster 1916. You are on this simple YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash user forward slash Noah Foster 210 for all things All Elite Wrestling. And coming very soon, this weekend, it's back, folks, and so am I. I'll be going in full force on NJPW. We'll have bracketology, discussions, predictions, and so much more. Stay tuned for more of that, as well as for community wage and hashtag Super Life Matters. And there will be some cells simply predicting on WWE Backlash as well as more content. And as he alluded to, support present discussion, support We Want Wrestling Talk, support Team All Lead, support Aftermatch Wrestling, Jeff Meacham Network, Greg Cherry Brand, support ODQ, and also support one another. Simple as that. And as always, I like to close, support your wrestling outlets with being small and it's for independent wrestling, folks. And let's keep growing this incredible, diverse, unique, elite, authentic, unscripted wrestling community together. Simple as that. With that, we are done here for this edition of AEW Spark. I hope you enjoyed the discussion. Please like, share, subscribe, comment, tell a friend. Hit the bell, no next video goes live on this channel. Hit the subscribe button, help me grow this channel, help me reach out to more of the rest of the community. If you want to have a discussion with me on all things All Elite Wrestling, it's simple. Just message me or Gary Joe. All you need is Skype. And if your camera might not work with you or you don't want to be on camera, Tim, your camera worked fine. And all I need is your voice because your opinions matter, your personality matters, and your fandom matters too. So until next time, for my good friend here and member of Team All Elite and Pro Discussions, Tim Tobin, I'm just a simple man, and my name is Noah Foster. I hope you all take care, enjoy life. Tomorrow's never guaranteed. Trust your families and enjoy wrestling. There's more of it than ever before. Find what you can connect with. Bring some joy to you. And support WrestleJoy, by the way, because it's an awesome new wrestling forum full of nothing but wrestling and positivity. Shout out to my good friend, Phoenix AEW. Hello, Amy. Until next time, I hope you all, please stay safe. Please be smart. Please treat everyone equally. And enjoy wrestling. And have a wonderful night. Tim, thank you again. Ladies and gentlemen, until the next time, take care and enjoy all eight wrestling. Simple as that.